Good evening. My name is Chantel, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Twilio fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star one again. Thank you. Andrew Zulia, Vice President of Invest Relations, you may begin your conference. Thanks, Chantel. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Twilio's fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. Our prepared remarks, earnings press release, investor presentation, SEC filing, and a replay of today's call can be found on our IR website at investors.twilio.com. Joining me today for Q&A are Jeff Lawson, co-founder and CEO, Mark Wojcicki, CRO, and Jose Mashipchandler, COO. As a reminder, some of our commentary today may be in non-GAAP terms. Reconciliation between our GAAP and non-GAAP results and further information related to guidance can be found in our earnings press release. Additionally, some of our discussion and responses may contain forward-looking statements, which are subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. In particular, statements about Twilio's outlook for the quarter ending March 31, 2022, Twilio's goals regarding delivering non-GAAP operating profitability beginning in 2023, then meeting annual growth rates and long-term non-GAAP gross margin targets. Twilio's expectations regarding our products and solutions. Twilio's expectations regarding business benefits and financial impact. From our acquisitions and our partnerships and investments, including the associated transactions. Our expectations regarding the impact of recent and future privacy changes on certain third-party platforms on Twilio and our customers. And Twilio's ability to manage changes in network service provider fees that we pay in connection with the business the delivery of communications on our platform, and the impact of those fees on our growth margins are subject to change. Should any of these risks materialize, or should our assumptions prove to be incorrect, actual financial results could differ materially from our projections or those implied by these forward-looking statements. A description of these risks, uncertainties and assumptions, and other factors that could affect our financial results are included in our SEC filings, including our most recent report on Form 10-K and subsequent reports on Form 10-Q, and our remarks today should be considered to incorporate this information by reference. Forward-looking statements represent our beliefs and assumptions only as of the date such statements are made. We undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements made during this call to reflect events and circumstances after today or to reflect new information or the occurrence of unanticipated events, except as required by law. With all that out of the way, I'll hand it over to Jeff for some opening remarks, and we'll open the call for Q&A. Thank you, Julie. I am very happy with our 2021 results, built on some great outcomes for customers that continue to generate the best in class growth for investors that you see today. I've never been more excited about the future of the company than I am sitting here right now. We have an awesome leadership team, the combination of our leading cloud communications platform with Twilio Segment's number one customer data platform gives Twilio an unparalleled view into the customer journey, setting us up as the company that can truly deliver on the customer engagement platform vision. We intend to become the software layer that digitally connects every business to their customers to introduce true personalized engagement and relationships in the next chapter of the cloud. We're builders, so our work is never done, and I'm incredibly eager to continue building the company in 2022 and beyond. With that, let's open the call for your questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then number one, on your telephone keypad. Our first question comes from Samad Samana with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, congrats on, on the strong finish to the year. It's great to see the, the organic growth. Maybe, Jeff, first for you, and just in reading over the prepared remarks, you know, I think the company really did a good job of expressing uh, moving from just the infrastructure side to more of the solutions layer. I'm curious if you could maybe help us understand how the, the adoption is going for, for the more solution-based products that, that the company's rolling out and how we should think about maybe the traction changing. I know you guys call that IDFA in particular as a driver. Like, are we at an inflection where that's accelerating, or how should we think about the, the shape of that adoption? Yeah, thank you, Samad. So, you know, I think there's, there's two parts to that question, which is, Essentially, you know, first of all, really pleased with how the introduction of our software layer is going. 
you know, if you think about it, look at some of the customers that we're talking about in our earnings calls, not just this time, but really every quarter, right? We've got great companies who are adopting flex and segment. Like I love the Virtu Motors example we were talking about today, uh, of them bringing flex and segment together to make the contact center better. You know, look at Stripe adopting flex for their contact center needs. And, you know, Flex expanding in global 2,000 financial services companies and a global 2,000 automaker and, you know, Nubank, many others, uh, you know, the uh, Invisalign putting in Flex for, for their process. I mean, you know, we can come up with so many of these customer stories, but really the, the answer is that our approach, this in and up strategy, is a great one. Because Twilio is used by so many companies around the world. Every industry, every shape and size, every continent. I mean, this really is the need for things like email and messaging is so ubiquitous. And developers bring this in with so little friction. We're able to use those initial wins and that initial traction that we get to move up the value chain, move up word charts, and move up the, the software staff uh, to then go address the things that our customers are trying to solve. For. Whether it's in the contact center, whether it's in their sales process, their marketing inside their product. I mean, that is really what, what the in and off strategy that we're talking about is all about, leveraging the ubiquity of Twilio across all these different kinds of companies into building this customer engagement platform that from our conversations with customers, they all need. Because they all have to go build great relationships with their customers. The way you do that is by understanding your customer and then engaging with them. And that's why Twilio having the leading CDP to understand customers, and then the leading communications platform to go engage with them. And this, that's why it's such a powerful combination. The second part of your question about IDSA and the tailwind uh, provided by privacy. Look, I, I think society is on the right track, right? Investing in privacy, passing regulation and laws, and, and things like deprecating tracking tokens. But if most consumers knew what had happened on the internet, they'd be pretty horrified, actually. So we are on the right track. And what this is doing is forcing customers to our customers, businesses, to focus on the fundamental business. The fundamental business. I think about my grandfather who sold paint to hardware stores in Detroit. And what do you have to do? You have to know your customer and then talk, you know, meaningfully to them about their business and about how you're going to help them. But that's the fundamental of the business. Understand this customer and talk to them. And so uh, by investing in privacy, means the companies have to actually use the first party data they have. So how people use their products, how people use their website, their mobile app, what they buy, what they return, et cetera. And use all that as signal for how they can digitally engage their customers and uh, make that experience more personalized and compelling. And so I believe that is a challenge. You know, that is a big trend, coupled with the whole direct-to-consumer market that's going on. Which, again, is like two sides of the same coin, if you will. That means the companies have to build their customer base and then engage them and turn them into repeat happy loyal buyers instead of just turning through customers and going acquiring more by buying more ads. And I think that's a big change that's going on in the ecosystem that, uh, that we in segment with the CDT uh, and then with the rest of our products are helping to follow us. Great. That's very helpful. Maybe just a quick follow-up for, for Kazama. First, appreciate the, the, the additional disclosures and, the, and the, the numbers around organic growth. That was very helpful by you and the IR team. Maybe if I just the, – the, the outlook for getting to – uh, profitability in 2023. I know we're still a ways out from that, but can you maybe help us understand what the assumptions are around? Is that going to come on the gross margin line, or is that mainly because of OPEX leverage or revenue mix? How should we think about what allows the company to get to that profitability and what you're assuming in that? Yeah, thanks, Juan. Well, thanks for the question. Appreciate you asking. So I think it's actually a combination of things. Some that will play out in the shorter term and then others that will kind of play out in the medium to long term. So the way to think about it, I think at least for the short term, is that the improvement is largely going to come from operating expenses. And one of the things that I mentioned in my prepared remarks and that we've talked about in the past is that we haven't been investing in a number of areas over the last several years. In particular, what we've been calling out historically has been flex, enterprise go-to-market, international go-to-market, and then core infrastructure. And we expect that our rate of cost growth in those areas just starts to moderate, basically, in the second half of, of the year. And I think a good example of that is our ERP project, which goes live in the middle of the year. And it's not to say that we're not going to invest in the other areas. We will. But I think the lower the, the rate of growth in those investments will be a little bit lower than what we've seen uh, historically. And I would add to that, you know, up to this point, we've really prioritized growth and, and scaling the company. And I think growth certainly remains a priority for the company, and, and we, you know, actively make that trade-off. 
historically. But I think we're at the point now where we've got enough scale that we can actually start reaping the benefits of that scale and just become more efficient in our, our operations. And so we see a real uh, efficiency opportunity as we look out, and we're really confident in our ability for non-GAAP profitability in, in 2023. I think over time, uh, in the medium to long term, we do expect improvements in our gross margin line as well. Obviously, um, that number does bounce around from period to period in the short term. And that's a trade-off that we also actively make because we like the fact that we're onboarding customers and have an opportunity to grow with them. But, you know, very consistent with what Jeff said a moment ago, as we onboard those customers and really leverage this in and out strategy and bring them into higher levels of the software stack, I think we have a real opportunity to provide value to customers, and I think that will provide a margin improvement uh, for us as a company, and that's why we stand by our 60% plus over time in the gross margin line. Great. Very helpful. Thanks for taking my questions. Thanks, Simon. Your next question comes from Derek Wood with Coed. Your line is open. Great. Thanks, and uh, uh, nice to see a strong quarter. Congrats. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeff or Mark, I mean, you guys have been on this journey to build out this this kind of CRM suite of applications. You you, you reference this in and up motion, and the product portfolio has certainly matured quite a bit. So, from a, from a go to market perspective, looking in in 2022, how are you planning to be more aggressive in this up stack, the up part of the motion, and and what would you like to see kick into a new gear in, in 2022? Eric, uh, thanks. Great question. This is Mark Ward at CM3. Um, it is front and center in the uh, way that we are going to market in 2022. As a matter of fact, we're in the final days of our sales kickoff this week, and the primary uh, objectives that we're enabling the team on are the internet strategy, so leveraging um, our install base and access to customers efficiently through email and messaging to sell them more broadly on the vision of the customer engagement platform. Um, you may remember we announced the customer engagement platform at Signal this past quarter. It's resonating with customers of all sizes, uh, driven by their desire to take more control over their digital engagement with customers. And we're hearing um, interest across the entire arc of their end consumer engagement, from top of funnel all the way through long-term loyalty. Um, so the training we're doing now as we're looking out to 2022 is supporting our sales team to ensure that they're ready and able to approach the opportunity that we see as a significant in the market today. Great. Great to hear. One for Kazema. Could, could you double click on the change in your guidance philosophy? Uh, how has your approach changed versus what it was before? And I guess what kinds of new insights have you gained or are more comfortable with uh, in order to, to, to better predict uh, con consumption behavior? Yeah, great question, Derek. So as you know, I mean, we run a, a usage base business model. For the most part, we have a little bit of staff in there as well. And I, I'd say with each passing year, we just had a lot more insight as to the way that customers end up using our platform. And we're just able to better predict um, usage patterns over time. And so – what we end up doing with our FDNA team is basically fine-tune that forecasting model every year. And as we can collect additional information, we're able to be more granular about the ways in which we can do that. So for Q1, we are refining our guidance philosophy, basically to provide guidance that is ultimately more consistent, not just with actuals, but also to give investors a, a better approximation of our expected performance. And as you saw in our Q1 guide, you know, we're showing continued growth of 45 to 47 on the reported, and then also um, 32 to 34% organically. I think it was important for us to call that out. Uh, that obviously does include segment now, and, you know, we have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to deliver on our 30% plus growth target over the next several years. And just lastly, I would say, Derek, that, you know, we, we obviously do get a lot of good feedback from, from our investors and from our analysts, and we take that into account, too. And, I think this just provides for a more consistent setup over time. Great. Well done, and, and, and great job on the disclosures. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Our next question comes from Michael Turin with Wells Fargo Security. Your line is open. Hey there. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. appreciate you taking the questions. Maybe my least favorite question to ask on the call but feels worth asking is on, on gross margin, 
clearly the growth is outstanding. The gross margins are, are stepping back here. It's clear international messaging strength is, is carrying forward, but how should we think about the trade-offs and when app services can help flatten that trajectory? And maybe secondarily, we saw the Cineverse transaction ended this morning. Is there still a chance you can partner there or, or comment to improve the core gross margins, or is that no longer the right way to, to think about that relationship? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. Uh, let me take the second one first, and then I'll answer the gross margin question more fully in a moment. So, first of all, uh, with respect to Cineverse, uh, I know there is some press out there suggesting that we might buy Cineverse. We're definitively not doing that. Um, what you probably did see in some of the uh, press announcements this morning is that the merger agreement between M3 and Cineverse uh, you know, has come to a termination as a result of a mutual agreement between those parties, and that largely reflects, you know, market conditions as they stand today. Uh, the way that that agreement worked was it did also provide for an alternative path, which is a minority investment uh, in Cineverse, and so that's now the path that we're going to be pursuing. The commercial wholesale agreement that we also referenced historically, you know, that's very much in place. We have a great relationship with Cineverse. Uh, it's been very long-standing, and we intend to continue that. And frankly, that partnership gives us uh, a great product, you know, for us to be able to leverage in, in the United States. So I don't really see a significant impact um, in the near or medium term as a result of any of that. Um, and just wanted to provide you a little bit more clarity on and, and some of what has been reported or speculated and, and clean that up. With respect to gross margins, you know, more broadly, you know, for us, and, and we've had this conversation, you know, with you and a number of others in the past, obviously, um, we have this really, really high growth messaging business. And, you know, we feel great about the way in which that business has been performing. And, you know, the way that it played out in Q4 was that our international volumes really, really took off. And, I mean, you're right. Like, it, it, that part of the business carries a sort of lower gross margin structurally, certainly relative to some of the other products uh, that, that uh, Mark and, and Jack kind of alluded to. But that messaging business also cranks out, you know, really significant gross profits that, that we like and that we want to reinvest. And I think most importantly, as Mark alluded to, it creates that install base, which is sort of that critical foot in the door for us to execute our, our in and up strategy. As you saw on the last page of the, you know, present presentation disclosures, while all of that is going on, our application services are actually growing at a, at a faster rate. You know, kind of a good problem that we have is that, you know, our messaging business organically also grew 52% last year. And so that's just kind of a trade-off that, that we want to make as long as we continue to generate high gross profits, as long as we can generate great growth off of application services and segments. We feel confident that over time we will be able to grow into that 60 percent plus range that I talked about earlier, um, and we have a lot of confidence in that. But in the short term, you will see it bounce around a little bit up and down. And again, in our disclosures, we probably we try to give you some sense of you know how to APPs and stuff like that uh, impact as well. It's a very comprehensive answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Our next question comes from Mark Murphy with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Yes, thank you very much, and I'll add my uh, congratulations. Um, Kazama, I'm wondering if you can shed any light on any specific products that are growing materially above or materially below th this organic growth level of about 39%. I would imagine um, flex video segment or outpacing I'm I'm less certain about voice, email, Authy, um, some of those products. Just curious if you're able to comment on on any of the uh, major outliers there. Yeah, Mark, uh, appreciate you asking the question. I mean, I'm not going to go through every single product and, and give the breakdown uh, here, but here's what I will say in answer to your question. Um, you know, again, just referencing the last page of our disclosures. If you look at our growth rate over the course of the prior year, you know, we grew our messaging business at incredibly high rates, 52% organically, you know, which on any basis is really super performance. And in spite of the fact that that part of the business is growing really fast, our application services category, which includes a number of those products that you just referenced a moment ago, basically pre-segment, pre-send grid, non telephony based cost products, you know, that's growing at a faster rate. 
the good problem that we have is is that that messaging business, you as you again can see on that page in terms of its revenue contribution, it's just really big. And so it's going to take some time for you know this in and out to play out in our financial statements, even though it is playing out very much in real life with our customer base. You know, beyond that, you also saw in the in the prior quarter, you know, segment had a really fantastic quarter, you know, really significant growth sequentially, you know, year over year. Obviously we don't break that out because it was inorganic in the prior period, but you can see the sequential was was really, really strong. And now that it's in our numbers, you know, we still have a, a tremendous amount of confidence in that thirty percent plus uh, over the next three years, which you know, quite frankly is off a much higher base since we've consistently beaten that. Um, since the time that we, we announced that we could do that. Thank you. That's very helpful. And as a quick follow-up uh, for Jeff, <coughs> you, you had mentioned the, um, the, the in and up uh, strategy. I'm just wondering how rapidly perhaps your R&D investment is shifting toward products that, that might be sold more to a marketer uh, rather than a developer. For instance, the, the customer journey insights, the engaged product, the kind of the the orchestration of messages rather than the delivery of messages. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, you, you can see we've got investments in, obviously, our, our core communications products, in segments, the core customer data platform, as well as in the products we're building above those two layers. Um, and the way I think about it, which is developers are assisting the sale, and for the communications APIs products, like, you know, developers can take us a long way, maybe even, you know, all the way there. But for a product aimed at a marketer or aimed at a contact center buyer, you're going to have a line of business owner who's going to make the final decision. But with Twilio, they get the support of their internal technical teams on the purchase, meaning the developers, the technical people are there at the table telling the business decision maker, like, yeah, that thing that we want to do, we believe we can do it with Twilio. In fact, we've already built a prototype. Time. And that supports the sale. It delists it. It adds momentum to the sale. As opposed to the world where, like, you know, I talk to a lot of our sales leaders and, like, in their, you know, yes, your, your careers of, like, prior companies, they would be selling you a line of business owner, and the line of business owner would say, oh, this is great. Can we do this? And they turn to their IT team. The IT team, IT team you know, with the arms folded is like, no, no, it will never work. Can't do it. And so you've got detractors on the technical team. And I think the magical thing about Twilio is that we can have proponents of Twilio both on the technical side and now with more investment in, in this sort of application area, also in the line of business owners. I think it's a powerful combination. And that's why we focus so much on winning the hearts and minds of developers, having them bring us into the company, and then making them some of our biggest champions as we make our way through, uh, through and up the org chart and pulling up the value stack of software. And so we are investing obviously in both. And I also think of the uh, application products that we're building are also very developer-centric in terms of customizability, flexibility, using code to really build what companies need is core to those products. We're not trying to provide just a turnkey and like you can't customize a type solution. We are trying to build products that while they do the things you want them to do out of the box, give you ample footprint to go in and turn them into the solution that the company needs for a long period of time. So you don't get boxed in and you're not stuck with something that's not serving your needs as markets evolve, as customers demand new things, et cetera. And uh, I think our approach is uh, as proven by the adoption by a wide variety of customers, whether they're the you know, young digital disruptors or whether they're the you know, global 2000 Fortune 500 companies. I think we see across the spectrum this, this approach is working. Very helpful. Thank you. Our next session comes from Meta Marshall with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. This is great. Uh, congrats. A couple of uh, questions. One. You know, you noted disclosure of having about 36% of the global 2,000, and just wanted to get a sense of is some of your confidence about the 30% growth rate for the next couple of years driven by room that there is within kind of this core customer set, or is it by the opportunity to win some of the more of the global 2,000? Just trying to get a sense of, you know, how much of it you feel like you've already landed that gives you confidence of that 30% growth rate. 
Um, the second question, you know, maybe building on what you just said, Jeff, you know, you've made a compelling argument at Signal about, you know, why Twilio is best enabled to help customers on their customer journey versus kind of some of some of the competitors out there. I guess are you finding with customers that you're even having to do some of this evangelism about why you versus others or it's still kind of in its infancy where they're just happy to have a, a solution that you can provide and, and give them? Thanks. Yeah, so hey, uh, thanks for the question. Let me take the, the first part of the 30% of the plus dynamic, and then I'll have Mark add to that, and we'll turn it over to Jeff. Um, so in terms of the 30% plus, I mean, the, the reason we have such confidence in, in our ability to do that over multiple years, it's not just because uh, we have relatively low concentration in GDK, but at the same time, I mean, we're able to do a ton of business uh, that's really creative and, and innovative with digital disruptors as well. And I mean, if you look at the way that the company has evolved over, you know, basically since the IPO, like a couple dynamics have played out, which I think are really interesting and, and give us uh, the level of confidence that we have in that number. The first is that if you look at the, the distribution uh, and concentration of our customers, you know, it used to be relatively high, and since then, We've taken on more business in our top 10, while that overall number has consistently shrunk over a number of different years. And so certainly you have some, some large companies in that bucket. You also have you know, some digital disruptors in that bucket who are really taking off. But the real point is, is that that breadth of customer that we serve is, is massively wide, which means that we're not overly concentrated in any one customer. We're not overly concentrated in any one industry. Uh, and that breath allows us, you know, to, to grow at scale now. I say the second thing is, is that you know we've talked a lot about uh, in the call already, like our our messaging business. But in addition to our messaging business, like we just have a lot more other products that we're able to sell into these customers. And so our ability to now kind of go up staff with our application services, with segment, with email, I think allows for another interesting kind of upsell, cross sell. Uh, opportunity that we're able to do uh, as well. And then I would say the third thing, and, and we've called this out in the past, is that we obviously have been making an investment in, in our international go-to-market efforts. We're starting to see that really pay off. We obviously saw a lot of takeoff velocity in the most recent quarter uh, with respect to that investment. And so I would expect to see that continue over time. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of customers out there in the world that, that we are really eager to serve. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. A great question, Meta. Um, picking up where uh, Hussein uh, left off, uh, the opportunity for us is still very massive beyond our existing footprint. So primarily landing new logos remains a, an important part of our enough execution. So landing with SMS from email and then being able to build a trustworthy relationship with the customer, as we've referenced a couple of times, that's a true um, – situation across all of the market segments. And as you pointed out, we still have a majority of the G2K out there where we have opportunity to build that initial relationship. The second dimension is expanding our footprint for uh, reaching out to the full white space of the account. And um, across our entire base, uh, we have that opportunity to go back to those customers and continue to build our relationship and expand the uh, commercial results that we're generating. And then lastly, we're recognizing that um, there are many enablers that are making a difference for us in the market. Like as an example, we power quite a few ISVs. They're selling package solutions against broad requirements. As partners, we're helping them to get into more of the base. Like we are also pursuing with SI and resellers that are projecting this into other kinds of opportunities, like what we shared in, the, in our disclosures, in our pre uh written um, statements, we are seeing traction with organizations like BPO. Uh, we shared with you on the last earnings announcement this relationship with HGS. We recently announced a relationship with Health Performance. Um, and HGS has had significant progress with over 20 of their customers moving over to Flex. Now, these are accounts that are relying on a channel strategy, if you will, for us to become as adopters of our platform. So we're going to be pursuing growth in, in all those dimensions, and I think largely the opportunity is still in front of us. 
I mean, you know, this is Jeff. I'll, I'll ask the uh, answer. The last part of your question about, you know, to what extent are we evangelizing to our customers? I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, customers have what they need to accomplish, right? Like they've got their challenges, they've got their market dynamics, their competitive pressures, and what that is leading most companies to is realizing that they need to have these direct relationships with their customers. When I talk to, you know, executives at every kind of company you can imagine, understanding their customer. Um, building that complete picture of their customer, and then acting on it to improve the outcome of their business, to spend less on, on marketing, to spend less on, on advertising in particular, um, to increase their retention rates, to uh, increase their, uh, or decrease their customer acquisition costs, and increase the lifetime value. I mean, these are the metrics that drive executives at pretty much every kind of company. And I think in oftentimes what happens is the people, the more bottom-up motion that Cleo has, are the people on the front lines who are tasked with solving these big problems, and they're the ones like, recognizing that Twilio can, can solve these problems. They bring Twilio in. And then we follow up with some more top-down education around the market, a new approach. And I think that's working very well. We have both a, a, a bottom-up and a top-down approach to, to our customers. And I'll share a quick story with you, which is which I thought was sort of illustrative of, of this, which was, I was just a few weeks ago, I was talking to the CEO of, of one of our co uh, customers, a pretty large company in the education space, and, you know, they've been using our products, and I was telling them about our engagement um, platform. And I was telling them about Flex and Frontline and, and Engage and, and all these new products we've been bringing to market the last several years. And the CEO stopped me in my track. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. And shared the screen, shared the screen on Zoom, saying, I, you know, I have a Gartner report here that says the old way of doing it was monolithic apps, and the new way is composable APIs. Jeff, you're not getting rid of APIs, are you? Which I was like, no, 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 of course not. We're building all this with our own APIs. We're making it so that you can actually go build on top of these platforms and unlock the things that you're trying to unlock by integrating these experiences together and, 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 and hiring developers and go building for, for your customers. And you said, okay, okay, phew, I was, I'm glad to hear that. And it was so interesting to me to hear the CEO of like an, an education company evangelizing to me the value of APIs and the value of composability that it was moment right there, a lot of these ideas um, are now widespread, right? Think about the fastest growing companies in the software and technology space. You know, companies like AWS, like Twilio, like Stripe. I mean, these are APIs. These are the building blocks that allow companies to go build their future and innovate for their customers, increase the agility of their company. That is what customers want, and we are able to provide it to them. And, well, but there, uh, there's always some degree of, of evangelizing um, when you are kind of moving the technology ball forward, it, it's not like we're just, you know, selling guacamole and everyone knows what that is. It's just a question of whether you want cilantro or not. Really, this is technology and how technology is enabling them to build their business, which does take more time and education than just selling guacamole, but I like the business that we're in. Perfect. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Alex Zukin with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks. As much Jeff as I'd love to, uh, to buy some guacamole, uh, cause I'm sure it would be delicious. Um, I want to ask you, uh, maybe, maybe two questions. First one on, um, I, I don't know if maybe somebody has already asked this, but I'll, I'll try it uh, a different way. What, what, when you think about the major differences in the demand drivers between Q3 and Q4, obviously it, it was just two very different quarters. And, and Kazama, you mentioned, you know, it's a consumption-based business and inherent in that is some volatility. But just help us understand, if you can, uh, or, or if, if you would, what were kind of the biggest differences? Like what made Q4 just such a great quarter uh, relative to Q3? And then the, the follow-up is just how to think about now, particularly with, with segment going into the organic bucket, What's the right way uh, for us to think about and model dollar-based net expansion going forward? I know you're not – that's not a metric you, you, you guide to, but, but any help there would, I think, you know, at least help set the, the, the right model framework going forward uh, to better understand the, the various components. Hey, Alex. Those are, uh, those are good questions. Appreciate you, uh, you asking. I would say in the demand driver space, I mean, there's nothing materially that really changed from, from one period to the next. I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that um, this is uh, a use of space business and, you know, in, in, in being that kind of a business, you're always going to see like a little bit of an up and down um, period to period. You're going to see, 
you know, certain customers take off in certain periods, we see a little bit of domestic versus international mix. Um, I'd say in the most recent period, international like really took off, and so you know that was something that that we feel really good about, obviously, because um, that's an investment that we've made over over a number of different years. But you know, it's not like we're trying to necessarily like tune the business so that international takes off one period and you know domestic goes a different way, or or that one product set goes one way or the other. Um, I would just really kind of point to broad-based strength across the totality of the business and. You know, we feel like the business was, was really good in Q3. We, we felt it was really good in Q4, and we really like the setup, you know, coming into 2022 and, and multiple years beyond. So I, it's hard for me to, like, really point to, like, that one thing, which I, I think is really the basis of your question. There, there, there really isn't one other than we had broad-based strength, strength across the business and, and feel good about the performance. I think with respect to, you know, the way that um, – you should think about segmenting layered in. I mean, we obviously have provided um, separate disclosures on segment on a year over year basis. We haven't, you know, kind of broken out uh, that's CB and E, their new their and E. I, I don't think I'm going to guide to that uh, here today. What I will tell you is, is that we feel really good about the growth prospects of that business. You can probably intuit from the fact that it was up 10% sequentially that we really like the growth trajectory of, of where it's headed. I think you probably can take from Mark's and Jeff's comments that we're seeing tremendous traction uh, with customers there, not just in terms of what we can do in combining it with messaging, but also with respect to combining it with flex, which is really, really exciting. And uh, we think that business has really, really strong growth prospects going forward. I'm going to point out you. is I'll just point out, Alex, one, one additional thing is that guacamole is a consumption-based business. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you, guys. Congratulations. Thanks, Alex. Our next question comes from Will Power with Braid. Your line is open. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, first one, perhaps for Kazema. Um, you pointed this out, but international growth clearly accelerated. It looks like quite a bit. It sounds like messaging was a big piece of that. I, you know, I'd love it if there's just any other color as to what the drivers behind that kind of surge in international messaging might have been and, and what else you might have seen internationally that uh, that drove some of that acceleration. Yeah, thanks for the question, Bill. Um, I'd say there's two dynamics. I, I think the first is that, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you've been a long-time follower of ours, obviously, and, we talked a lot about our international go-to-market investments, and Mark's built a really great team internationally, and I think we're really starting to see the fruit of that investment. Um, and you've seen that, I think, over multiple quarters now with our ability to grow in, in international markets. I think the second dynamic is, is that there was one customer in particular whose volumes really, really took off uh, in Q4, which uh, you know we felt pretty good about as well. Um, that happens from time to time, too, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a gross margin dynamic and all that as well, but um, feel great about the way that international lends, and uh, we think there's continued strength over a long period of time. Okay, great. Um, and then and maybe for Jeff, um, you know, just building on some of the other commentary, just looking at your, you know, your growing strategic position around first-party data, you know, the in and up strategy that you've referenced, you know, what are the pieces that you think could bolster that further? I mean, it doesn't sound like you necessarily need anything, but are there natural tangential areas that, you know, further solidify that? And, and I guess more broadly, maybe how do we think about, you know, kind of the M&A pipeline and, and appetite here? Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, appreciate the question. You know, first of all, just sort of like what are the pieces that bolster it? And I think it's, you know, continued execution. Where we've got products that act, Great revenue scale continue to expand very nicely. So when I think about, you know, how are we continuing to make sure our messaging product is best in class or email product is best in class, um, uh, segment I think is fantastic for bringing customers in as well. Like, so we've got a lot of best in class products. We've got a lot of pieces, uh, and we're in the process of bringing them together. And so when I think about what, we're, uh, what is ahead, it's like we're bringing these pieces together. We've got clearly three pillars of our engagement platform. You know, we've got – uh, engaged with the marketer, which is still very early in its cycle, by the way. We just announced it in, in Q4. Um, we've got frontline, which can be used by frontline workers and, and sales teams and things like that. And then you've got uh, Flex for the contact center. Right? So clearly there's a lot of buyers there. There's a lot of CAM there already. 
and we're continuing to bring those together, uh, bring those products um, to more and more and more customers. As far as M&A pipeline, yeah, I'm going to give you the answer that I always give uh, because it's true, which is that, you know, we always have an active game board because uh, obviously if there are acquisitions out there that are accelerating our roadmap, um, we should be willing to do them. But we also, of course, maintain a high bar, great companies, great cultures, great products, and those are things that we're interested in. But uh, we don't have any particular strategic goal or, or anything that we're going after. But, you know, of course, like any company of our size and with our balance sheet, you know, we're aware of what's out there. Hey, well, I'll just add one comment to what Justin at the end there, which is um, obviously in the current market, there may be some attractive opportunities and, and we'll be on the lookout. But the reality is we're very, very focused on our organic growth rates right now and we want to continue growing the business that we've got. We don't see a burning need to necessarily do anything. And I would just reiterate uh, for anyone that missed earlier, like there was the speculation that we might purchase a and we're certainly not going to do that. Yeah, no, appreciate that. Thanks. Our next question comes from Ryan McWilliams with Barclays. Your line is open. Next taking the question. Looks like Twilio's presence in global 2,000 customers doubled since the end of 2020. So congrats. Jeff, I know it's still early, but love to hear about the strategy and expectations behind Engage and, you know, how customers so far are starting to come around to the idea of using Twilio as their, like, unified customer engagement platform. Absolutely. I'll start with Engage. I mean, the way we see the market is that, you know, historically, uh, marketing automation products really focus on running the campaign, right? So you get traded in there, you get send buttons, and you get to see how many people open it, uh, how many people open the, uh, the, you know, the campaign. And, like, that's the way they were designed, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And that's still a product that most companies use today. But actually, the more um, modern marketing stack is one that is driven not by campaigns, but by data. It's actually driven by a rich set of data about every customer and who they are and sort of what message is going to actually resonate most with them. And by the way, the outcome they're looking for isn't just, did they open an email? It's like, did they make a purchase? Did they increase the lifetime value? Are they actually a more valuable customer? And these end up being like, you know, complex sets of campaigns, multivariate analysis. Like, uh, great marketers today are using data in incredibly interesting ways that the legacy uh, marketing software just really isn't set up to accommodate. And that's the opportunity that we're going after. And we're going after a very data-centric approach to marketing in the belief that, you know, many marketers are already there and the ones who aren't are going to get there first. And I think this is already proven out by the traction that the segment CDP has in the market because the CDP is actually how you rate the whole thing into actionable insights to the marketer. The last step is just kind of, you know, next thing you can't pay, and that's what we're adding on with Engage. But the hard part about that whole equation is the data part. And we already do that. We're already leading the market in that. And so adding actually the marketing execution side onto it um, is actually a relatively light list compared. So we're very excited by the feedback we're getting from our early customers. Um, we think that uh, we've got a really novel and uh, attractive approach. And ultimately, at the end of the day, look, it is the, the same budget we're going after that the legacy clubs enjoy today because that's the marketer's budget. Uh, but uh, I think that it's, uh, it's where the market is going, and I think we're, we're going to have a leading product uh, as, it's, as the market is getting there. And you already see, already see traction in that the market going on. Um, I, the, the second question you had, can you repeat, repeat that one, Frank? No, that was, that was a great color. I appreciate it. Um, just my second one for Kazema, just uh, pleased to hear about non-GAAP operating profitability uh, for fiscal 23. Just getting some questions here on gross margin. Like, I completely understand how it can vary from quarter to quarter, but as we think about the path forward from here, can we think about gross margin being higher on a yearly basis going forward, given the elevated growth in the higher margin application services business? Yeah, you're right. I think it's a, it's a totally fair question. I, we're not going to guide on a year-to-year -year basis, per se, on gross margins. What I will say, though, is that we feel very, very good about the progress that we're making on application services. That's kind of the non telephony based cost product that we have, X segment, second grid. As you saw in our disclosure in the prior year, that grew at a much faster rate than even our very fast growing messaging business. And so as that trajectory continues, uh, we feel very good about the prospects to get to our 60% plus target. To which I would add, we feel really, really good about the way the segment is going. We feel very, very optimistic about how Engage has already started. And so the combination of those factors, I think, gives us very high confidence in 60% plus over time. 
in the meantime, as long as the messaging business that we put on generates high gross profits, we are comfortable from period to period with that gross margin number, you know, bouncing a little bit up and down. But over time, you know, we still feel very good about 60% plus. And I think we have a great track record with investors of you know, delivering what we say we'll do. And I think over time, we will get to that 60% plus. Thanks, Keller. Thanks, Doug. That's right. Our next question comes from Fred Havmeyer with McQuarrie. Your line is open. Hey, <clears throat> thank you. You know, Jeff, Twilio's product and platform has certainly expanded a lot since, you know, I think its heritage is a, a platform and, um, you know, channel to be able to rickroll people back in 2008. And I wanted to ask, you know, from your perspective as a uh, founder, whenever you put on your coding gloves and you're thinking about, you know, what's exciting on Twilio's platform and what are the products that are disruptive or interesting or that you would use to build the next iteration of startups and growth businesses, what gets you most excited about what is happening with Twilio? Well, that's a uh, fantastic question. You know, when I think about it, it really goes back to the, um, the mission of our company. And if, if you notice, we updated our mission last year. We talked about it a little bit um, in, last year. We'll talk about it more in, in some upcoming venues. But, like, we updated our mission to really reflect the reason why I and so many of Toyo get out of bed in the morning, and it's to, to unlock the imagination of the world's builders. And what's so exciting about that mission is that people are, you know, humanity's been, been, been you know, the world that we see today is created by people who build, and they're built for thousands and thousands of years. And what you see now happening in the world of software and the internet is people building at a scale that was previously unimaginable. You know, a, a developer or a startup or a, a company can build a product, and if they build the right thing, millions or billions of people can become their customers practically overnight. And that is a scale of execution and an idea that I think is underappreciated in the world. That with software and the Internet and the distribution mechanisms that the Internet provides, anybody can be a builder. Anybody can unlock a new idea. And that goes for developers, that goes for a wide variety of builders inside of companies. It also goes for the companies themselves. And I love seeing, you know, when a startup enters a market and comes out with some great new big idea. And then the incumbents follow suit. And actually, they start coming up with the big new great ideas. Like, I've been loving watching what's going on in the, in the EV market, for example, with, like, you know, Ford doing a great job bringing out cool new EV products. And, like, I'm from Detroit, so I pay attention to these things. But it's really cool to see how the markets evolve and software ultimately becomes this vehicle, no pun intended, for companies and people to change the world. And so what gets me tremendously excited about the products that Twilio builds is that we get to unlock the imagination of the builders who are our customers. And for so long, companies have been told, because they bought a bunch of apps to follow their business, they bought an app for this, an app for that. And then they have this idea, they're like, oh, we want to go, like, our customers want this, let's go do that. And, and when you're told, you're like, oh, no, it doesn't do that. And you're told, no, we can't do it. And what I love is giving our customers the path to yes. This idea that we have for how we're going to better serve our customers or we're going to out-innovate our competition, the answer is with Twilio, it's yes. And that's our APIs, that's our platform approach, that's Flex, that's Frontline, that's Engage, that is Segment. This is unlocking the imagination of the world's developers. And, like, you know, aside from the various TAMs of, like, you know, marketing and contact centers and messaging and all that stuff, if you take a step back and you think about the addressable market of people who build, like, that's the story of humanity. And that's my favorite part about building Twilio. Hey, thank you. Um, you know, when Twilio Intelligence for Voice is available to me, I'll spend a weekend hacking together a uh, project to order guacamole. So thank you. Our next question comes from Matt Van Fleet with BTIG. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks for taking the question, guys. Nice job on the quarter. Um, you know, you've, you've kind of touched on, on parts of this, but wanted to, to maybe bring it together in one cohesive question. When you look at segment and the, the rate of adoption um, across the enterprise, you know, it seems like the idea maybe at the very high end, um, Jeff, to your point of talking to a CEO, it's a great idea. Everyone realizes that they need more data to be smarter and more individualistic in, in terms of their outreach. But, 
in reality, how many of these companies that you're talking to are ready to, to implement segment? How much of sort of a customer education and maturity level um, is, is broadly out in the market? And, and maybe the follow-up to that is, is there potential that you could see this pretty dramatically accelerate over the next couple of years as companies get a little smarter, maybe are technology uh, a little more up-to-date across other parts of the organization to really leverage segment. At Mark Kordinsky, uh, great question, um, and it's a added lens to the earlier question regarding the opportunity just in front of us. Um, the opportunity is it cuts across the entire market. Uh, we see the, the interest that comes from um, small customers all the way to the largest customers. And your point about, are they ready to adopt? Um, we see requirements to start at the use case, where literally you need to be able to connect a couple of uh, real-time data sources to be able to have um, an understanding of the customer and then provide whatever interaction that's going to take place to progress the customer relationship. So imagine, if you will, connecting to a CRM, um, connecting to a point-of-sale system, connecting to whatever the app is that the company runs their business on, to be able to get to that understanding and then be able to respond in the channels of the customer's choice in order to have that, you know, in order to have that interaction. And that, by the way, can be across the entire arc of the customer relationship. What we see happen is that we can move from that use case orientation to strategically more and more of their customer requirements. Um, and be able to address a greater set of commercial requirements that position CDP as a strategic part of the way that they think about building and expanding the relationship. So, like as an example, um, you know, we share today the uh, the Virtu Motors um, example, where they have implemented um, segments in order to understand the caller that's calling in be able to look up and see that they're, in fact, a uh, customer that bought from them in the past, to be able to see what car they bought, to know what the residual value is, to then um, prepare the agent to be able to have the right conversation with that customer and be able to um, more than likely sell them another car. We're seeing that kind of um, opportunity from, from use case to expanded, strategic, full customer lifecycle requirement. Great. And then um, I guess on the, the flex side of the business, it, are you still traditionally going in and replacing or, or sort of augmenting and building on top of um, legacy on-prem solutions that have just, you know, maybe run their course of, of functionality? Um, or, or are you increasingly seeing opportunities where customers rush to get anything that was supposedly cloud or hosted at the beginning of the pandemic but now realize that it's, you know, they can't configure it, they can't do actually what they wanted or what they thought it could, and are now looking at what Flex and, and Twilio more holistically can mean as a, you know, 5, 10, 15-year partner from a technology perspective? In, um, in smaller customers, uh, so think of this as, like, digital disruptors up to, like, a mid-market price account, uh, we do have a fairly healthy portion of the business that is there first real implementation of a, of a um, contact center type solution. They may not call it contact center, by the way. They may call it their support solution or their customer engagement solution. Um, but as you move up to larger organizations, more legacy implementations, you actually see a lot more of install base. Uh, we have a fairly healthy augmentation uh, business, as we called out uh, in our remarks, that people are adding uh, new channels and new capabilities in parallel with their legacy implementation. Um, but we're also winning more and more replacements of legacy implementation. Uh, the example that we shared in um, our prepared remarks regarding a lie, which is a, a great customer example, you know, a very digital-oriented uh, business that um, has a legacy uh, supplier that um, actually faced some challenges, and the customer was able to rapidly spin up a replacement uh, implementation on Twilio that is now their standard for their requirements going forward. Um, 
Now, that's not the way that you're necessarily going to win the business overall. We're not going to wait for people to fail. We're showing up and helping customers recognize that the next generation of engagement can't be satisfied with the legacy player in the way that Flex is. And we have many examples that uh, range from you know, Fortune, 100, uh, uh, Fortune 100 banks to um, uh, Global, uh, Fortune 100, pardon me, Global 2000 automotive manufacturers that have successfully uh, implemented Flex to meet their full requirements. You know, Matt, this is Jeff, and I just thought I'd add one thing, which I, I thought was interesting. You know, when I was first getting to know segments and before we did the acquisition, I was really struck by their penetration into the enterprise. Um, and we've had a number of great enterprise customers uh, speaking about their implementation of Flex. You know, just at, our, at Signal, we had Procter & Gamble, who's a great customer. We had Intuit, uh, the CTO of Intuit, Mariana Tessel, on stage, talking about their use of segment across all their properties. You know, we have a Fortune 100 financial services company that we just announced in this quarter that we signed uh, in Q4. Uh, Nike is a well-known customer. Right? So we've got great enterprise customers um, who are using segment already. And so I just... I, I, I'm struck by how early the need in enterprises uh, has been apparent. When you think about the more complex the businesses, the more subsidiaries there are, the more brands they run, the more you know systems they've implemented, the more the need is for a customer data platform to help them make sense of all of it. So I've been really pleasantly surprised by the traction, even before the acquisition, that Second already had in the market, and therefore the need for CDP. All right, great. Thankful. Thank you. Very helpful. Great, we are up at time. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that still have questions in the queue. Uh, we will catch up with you uh, this afternoon. So otherwise, thank you everybody for joining and look forward to catching up over the rest of the quarter. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.